First Timothy chapter number three. A lot of preaching in this chapter. But I just want to get to the conclusion of this chapter. Just read three verses. Verse 14 says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you, Lord, that you bought us. And then thank you, Lord, you became our best friend. We thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Now, Lord, as we assemble here this morning, there are some who are traveling, some who are providentially hindered, and some are sick. We pray for them. Father, we pray for Miss Veronica's family and the loss of her aunt. Lord, but we know she's not lost. We know where she's at. And God, I pray that, Lord, you would comfort this dear family. And God, I pray that, Lord, you would help them. Lord, during these times of grief. You are the great comforter, and we pray your comfort in their stead. I pray for that little boy, Jared, that's in that induced coma there in Louisville. You touch him. I pray for that little boy named Jackson that has cancer. You'd be with him. Father, I pray for uh, those that uh, uh, are misfortunate this morning that does not know you in the free pardon of sins. They're living, but they're not alive. They're dead in trespasses and sin. I pray for those who are low in spirit. I pray for those that are in valleys. I pray for those that have faced opposition and obstacles. I pray for those that, Lord, uh, are seeking and need to find. I pray for those that are asking and need to receive. I pray for those that, Lord... uh, 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 are less fortunate that, God, you would meet their needs. And, Father, I certainly pray for the next few minutes you would arrest our attention. Lord, uh, you've been good to us. You have blessed us. You have allowed us to come to the house of God. uh, And regardless of what we faced before we walked into this place, uh, we're without excuse not to praise you, uh, not to worship you, uh, not to exalt you. uh, For, Father, without you, we would have no hope. Uh, Without you, Lord, uh, we'd already be on our way to devil's hell. Uh, But I'm thankful for the day uh, when you came and went to the cross uh, and made a way that even old Gentile dogs like us uh, could know you and be able to come uh, and worship you. Uh, Thank you for the Word of God. Uh, Thank you for the people of God. Uh, And thank you for the blessings of God. Uh, Now have your way. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll bless you and praise you, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention just a couple things as a way of introduction. The Apostle Paul, writing to young pastor Timothy, a man he'd won to the Lord, uh, a man he had trained in the Lord, uh, a man that now is being uh, used as a pastor, and Paul is writing this epistle uh, 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 to instruct him, to encourage him, to help him, uh, and here he expounds on a few things. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, he deals with behavior. Uh, We find in verse number 15, he says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought is to behave thyself uh, in the house of God. Uh, uh, can I say something? Uh, uh, the Bible uh, uh, is very clear uh, on how Christians ought to act. Uh, uh, we find in the Scriptures uh, uh, that it teaches us how we're to act outside the walls of the church. Uh, uh, we are to be a light uh, into this dark world. Uh, we are to take the gospel uh, to sinners. Uh, we are to show compassion uh, and mercy uh, regardless if people deserve 
serve it. Uh, uh, we are to be an extension uh, and an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in this world that is against him and against us. But here the Apostle Paul also uh, reminds us that he has taught us how we're to behave ourselves uh, in the house of God. Can I say, uh, this isn't a bar. This isn't a club. This isn't an organization. This is uh, the church uh, of the living God. Uh, and the Bible teaches us that we're to esteem others better than ourselves. Uh, uh, too many churches get in problems uh, where people think they're better than somebody. Uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, 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 you want to have a good church, you make yourself lower than everybody. Uh, we're to esteem others better than ourselves. Uh, uh, the Bible teaches us uh, that we are to bear one another's burdens uh, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, uh, we're to care for others uh, and others needs more than our own needs. Uh, now the Bible tells us that we're to restore those uh, that are the strangers to the faith. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us uh, uh, that we're to be kind to sinners. Uh, uh, we're to be kind to one another. Uh, we're to love one another. Uh, uh, we're to unify with one another. Uh, and all of our desire ought to be Jesus uh, above all things. Uh, uh, he also instructs when people don't behave right, and they don't get right, uh, that you need to deal with them. And the Bible says that we're to rebuke them before all that others may fear. You see, it's very important that we behave ourselves in a Christian and godly manner. And if we don't, we're to be dealt with. Now, I don't know about you, but there were times when I was young and I didn't do right. My parents didn't let me go on not doing right. They would instruct me. And Brother Bob, if instruction didn't work, they had a method that did work. Now, I know we live in 2020. By the way, today is September 20th of year 2020. It's kind of weird, huh? But I know in 2020, it's taught that children... Tell the parents what to do. Well, I know at the foster household, even though the children are old, grown, the baby's 22, au contraire, they don't tell the parents what to do. Can I say, in the house of God, we don't tell God what to do. So Paul deals with behavior. He also deals with the basis of what we're, why we're here. He said that thou mayest know how to behave thyself in the house of God. But he goes on to say this, which is the church of the living God. Here it is, the pillar and ground of the truth. He makes it very clear that the church is the foundation, and he makes it clear who the founder is, God. And this is the basis, the fundamental element uh, of what we need uh, in our lives. It is the pillar and the ground uh, of the truth. And we know that He is the Lord Jesus, uh, the truth, uh, the life, uh, and the way. Uh, and this is His business. Uh, and it ought to be the foundation of your life. Uh, uh, your life ought to be based uh, upon the book and upon the house of God. Uh, and if you put uh, a God first in your life... Uh, God will take care of the rest of the aspects of your life. Uh, but every truth and every foundation that you need in your life is brought forth through and by the church and the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, it is the foundation and fundamental of your life. I don't understand folks that don't think they need church. Listen, I was in a lot of church this week. It never dawned on me not to be in church today. Some of y'all make up your mind Saturday night whether or not you come to church. There's never a decision to be made like that in my mind. I need the things of God. I need preaching. I need fellowship. I need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if we're left to our own conceits, we'll go bad. Hmm? 
we see the behavior, we see the basis, but then he, he lets us know that beyond a shadow of a doubt what our focus ought to be. Notice what he says, verse 16, and without controversy. That literally means beyond a shadow of a doubt. He says, you can nail it down. He's saying this is undeniable. He is saying this is indisputable. He is saying this is irrefutable. Can I say it wasn't until the last century that people even doubted it. True. They've always known that Jesus came. Right. Hmm. Now some didn't like it and some fought against it. Now in a, 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 all of our education, all of our wisdom, we're trying to teach that God doesn't exist. But even the very conscience of a man knows that there is a God. But he says, without controversy, beyond a shadow of a doubt, great is the mystery of godliness. Can I say God's ways are above our ways? He has mysterious ways. And it is the greatest of all mysteries why Jesus, and that's what he gives us, the uh, uh, the, the life of Jesus on this earth in a nutshell. That's what he, he gives us. Look what he says. He said he was, God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus came born of a virgin. He was justified in the spirit. Uh, uh, we know that. Uh, when he uh, uh, had John baptize him, the, uh, the spirit of God descended upon him in the form of the dove. And God said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Uh, 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 goes on to say that he was seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. We ought to say hallelujah. Believed on in the world uh, and received up into glory. I mean, that was the life of Christ in a nutshell while he was here. And can I say the greatest of all the mysteries of God is why would Jesus go through that? Why would God care about you and me? I mean, there's a lot of mysteries. I mean, uh, uh, that he threw all them stars out there and called them by name. I mean, that's a mystery how he did all that. How he spoke the world in existence, that's a mystery. We know through the Word of God that the world was framed by his Word, but it's a mystery uh, 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 how God decided uh, uh, that our eyes needed to be where our eyes are and our nose needed to be where... Uh, that's all a mystery. Uh, God is mysterious in how he does things, uh, but the greatest mystery is that God would look at sinners... Uh, in his holiness uh, and decide to come and die for us that's a great mystery mm, but beyond a shadow of a doubt he did mm. and with God's help for just a few minutes this morning I want to preach on the manifestation of the master he said God was manifest in the flesh that means God put on flesh and became like us. That's a great mystery. Mm -mm. Listen, there's still some that believe Jesus just, just started 2,000 years ago. But we know He's the Alpha and Omega. We know there's never been where He wasn't. Mm. But 2,000 years ago, He decided to put on flesh. And that's what I want to preach on, the manifestation of of the master. First of all, let me uh, just say this. I want you to notice the trail of Jesus. What path did he trod? Well, can I say he traveled from heaven, from glory, to Bethlehem. He left heaven, walked into the womb of Mary, uh, and came forth uh, in Bethlehem. Now we know he was born of a virgin. We know why he was born of a virgin. Uh, if he would have been uh, had an earthly father, then it wouldn't no matter what death he died. Uh, his blood could not be our propitiation. Uh, he could not redeem us. Uh, he could not satisfy us. Could not help us. Uh, uh, he had to come from glory, born of a virgin, because his blood uh, was royal, redeeming blood, and it took his blood to save you and I. He left glory and came to Bethlehem. From Bethlehem, he went to Egypt. Uh, uh, from Egypt, he ended up in Nazareth. Uh, uh, and we know it as a 12-year-old boy. Uh, his family came to Jerusalem to observe the Passover. Uh, and while he was there, uh, you find him in the temple, uh, in the synagogue, uh, uh, making the scholars marvel at his wisdom. Uh, well, he is uh, uh, God. Uh, he does know everything. Uh, he is omnipotent. He is omniscient. 
and he is omnipresent. Uh, and I imagine he had them boys' heads spinning, just a 12-year-old boy. Uh, can I say this? Uh, 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 he returns to Nazareth by, from the temple. Uh, uh, actually, his parents went before him uh, uh, and forgot him. Hmm? You know, it's always a bad thing when you leave without Jesus. When a day's journey, you say, well, anybody seen Jesus? When they came back, where'd they find him? Wherever you, where you always find him, in his house. Anyway, that's another story, huh? Uh, Mary says, your father and I, and he corrected her. He says, no, I was about my father's business. And Joseph is not my father. Huh? Matter of fact, you don't, you don't hear Joseph mentioned after that anymore. I don't know where he died, how he died, when he died. But I know one thing. The father's never died. He went back to Nazareth. And there he's known and became known as a carpenter. That's amazing, Brother Bob. Because he already knew how to make things. Because he'd already made everything. Huh? He already knew how to measure things. Huh? He measured all the way from the sides of the north to the lowest hill. Uh, uh, he knows the depths, the heights. He, he's the one who created measurement. Huh? Yes, sir. Can I say this? He already knew how to mend things. Can you imagine people bringing things to Jesus broken and then when they got it back as better than when they took than when they got it new? He already knew how to mend things, but he became a carpenter. Can I say this? Around 30, he started his earthly ministry. We find him at the river Jordan when John cried, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And there he permitted John to baptize him. Let me just say this. Uh, a baptism has nothing to do with sin. Baptism has to do with identifying with God and God's statutes, God's local church. But can I say, Jesus, uh, 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 John baptized unto the remission of sins, and Jesus was baptized not because he was a sinner, but he came to fulfill the law, and that was under the law, and he had to do that in order to start his ministry. Can I say, we find him there. He then begins to, uh, 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 throughout the next three years, doing all kinds of miraculous things. We find he heals the sick. The cripples are no longer crippled. The lame are no longer lame. Uh, uh, those that have uh, dreadful diseases like the issue of blood, uh, 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 that woman had for 12 years, God healed her of that. Uh, can I say this? He did many miracles. Uh, he took a few uh, 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 fishes and a couple of loaves of bread and he fed the multitudes. Uh, uh, I mean, he raised the dead. Uh, he opened blinded eyes. He did a lot of miraculous things uh, in those three years. You know why? Because the Jews required a sign. And he proved in all of his works who he was. He fulfilled the scriptures and what he was doing. Isaiah 35 tells us only God can open up blinded eyes. And he did it on several occasions. Uh, a friend of mine, Dr. Joe Bryant, said this. He said, I wasn't there to see Jesus turn the water into wine. He says, but I have seen him turn liquor into rent into food, into electric bills, into birthday presents. Uh, I've seen him turn liquor uh, uh, into furniture. He said, I've seen, I didn't see him turn water into wine, but I've seen what he's turned liquor into. Huh? He's still doing miracles, by the way. Can I say this? Jesus went on to Calvary where he bled and died for the sins of the whole world. From there he went to the lower parts of the earth. And can I say from there uh, 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 he resurrected and then he ascended back into heaven where he sits on the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, and can I say on the third Saturday, March 1974, he came to me, hallelujah, and he saved me and he changed me. Uh, I, I, when you look at the paths of Jesus, I'm still, uh, he, I'm still glad he comes to sinners and he saves old sinners. Uh, we see the trail of Jesus. I want you to notice the tears of Jesus. In John chapter 11, verse 35, the Bible said, Jesus wept. In verse 36, then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Can I say, in those tears, he showed his love and his compassion for those that were hurting. 
And if you're here hurting today, I've got good news. Jesus cares for you. And he tells you to cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Nobody loves you like Jesus loves you. You say, well, I didn't ask him to love me. It's because you didn't have enough sense to. He's loved you with an everlasting love. No matter your heartache, no matter your heartbreak, no matter what sin you're committed, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you. We see the trail of Jesus. We see the tears of Jesus. But I want you to notice the travail of Jesus. What I'm about to read you, he did for you. The Bible says in Mark 14, 34, And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. In Luke's account, in chapter 22, verse 44, he says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When Jesus was about ready to fulfill his passion and go to the cross, he fought the greatest battle in the Garden of Gethsemane. There the devil tried to kill him. He began to hemorrhage in his prayer, and his sweat turned into great drops of blood. He's travailing because he knows if he dies in the garden, his flesh gives out in the garden, the Bible wouldn't be true and you'd have no hope. Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he, bear, he shall bear their iniquities. He travailed for you. Amen. He agonized for you. He loved you so much he was willing to pay the ultimate price for you. Brother Josh, if you'd have been the only one that would put faith in him and trust in him and repent him and accept him as Lord and Savior, he'd have still travailed in the garden for even you. The old songwriter wrote, Miss Kathy sings it on occasion. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. He looked ahead in time and saw your need of a Savior and travailed for your soul. Not only see the travail of Jesus and the tears of Jesus, I want you to notice the thorns of Jesus. It was one thing to battle in the garden. It was another thing to take the next step. The Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 29, And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and took the reed, and smote him on the head. If you handle rose bush, and Brother Ray was at my house last week, and uh, went to do something and hit a rose bush, found him a little thorn. Then I had to hear him whine about it for three days. You grab a little rose bush, you get one of them thorns, they hurt. We got this goofy bush that's been in the back of our house since we moved there, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Every time I weed eat around it, I don't know what's in that thing, but it's got some kind of thorns. It'll prick you. And bless God, one of these days, Miss Nett's going to come home, and it's not going to be there. You know what I'm saying? But we see these little thorns and thistles. We think that's what they put on his head. But in Bible days, the thorns that they'd used to make those crowns out of were three or four inches long. They were spikes. And Brother Bob, when they put that crown of thorns on his head, they just didn't set it on there. They pressed it down upon his brow those thorns peeled the flesh from his brow then they spit on him then they took that reed which is like a cat of nine tails it's like bamboo and they smote him on the head where that flesh had just been peeled from so why did he go through so much because he loved you because he is the king of glory 
And that's how mankind treated him. But that's not how he treats us. We see the thorns of Jesus. But the Bible also realizes the torture of Jesus. We're talking about him being manifest in the flesh. This is what he went through. The Bible said in Mark 15, verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. You see, when Pilate gave Jesus over to the soldiers, the whole band showed up. The Bible said they scourged him. What that simply means is after they platted his head with those thorns, after they hit him with the reed, they brought him back before Pilate. Uh, and now Pilate says he's yours. Uh, and they take him into the hall of praetorium uh, and they stripped him of his garments. Uh, they tied his hands uh, to a whipping post uh, to where he's uh, 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 stretched forth, where he's probably on his tippy toes. Uh, and they take a cat of nine tails, uh, uh, which is a, a, a whip with many many uh, leather uh, uh, extensions off of it. And on the end of each, each extension, there's bone fragments and pottery fragments. Uh, and they uh, uh, began to scourge him and beat him. Uh, and when they'd hit him with that thing, it would wrap around him. Uh, and when they would pull it away from him, uh, it would rip the flesh off of him. Uh, then it ripped the muscles off of him. Uh, uh, the Bible says uh, uh, in Isaiah 52, his visage was marred much more than than any man. Uh, he was beaten beyond recognition. But James, they said the whole band came. I believe they all took a shot at him. Why would they all show up? Under Jewish law, they scourged a man, they'd beat him with 39 stripes because they fought, thought 40 was inhumane. But the Jews didn't crucify him. It was the Romans. They was known to be a man up to a hundred times. But he was marred much more than any man. Who knows how many stripes he took. He took one for every wicked thought you'd have. He took one for every wicked thing that you would touch. He took one for every wicked place you would go. He took one for every wicked thing you would say. He took one for every wicked thing you would do. He was tortured. See those little paintings you see with little blood on his hands and his feet? That's not what he looked like. Isaiah tells us that they plucked his beard from his face. Luke 22 says this, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy who it is that smote thee. And many other, blasphemy, uh, many other things blasphemously spake they against him. They punched him and beat him spit upon him and kicked him. What was he guilty of? Brother Bobby's guilty of loving you. Brother Eddie, his guilt was that he loved you. And everybody else in here, he was guilty of loving you and not wanting you to go through that and die and go to hell. After they got done beating him, John 19 says, verse 16, Then delivered he him, therefore Pilate delivered him unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. And two other with him, on either side one in Jesus in the midst. The world paints a picture that Jesus was this little effeminate sissy kind of a guy where he let everybody walk on him 
And they have the same ideology about us, Brother Clint. We need to act that way. Just accept whatever they say. But Jesus wasn't a sissy. First of all, he drove the money changers out of the temple, made a three-quarter whip. He wasn't a sissy. But nobody could take the beating he took except him. And after they would beat him beyond recognition, Donald, they laid a cross on his back. Can you imagine no flesh on your back? And now this wood, rough, heavy cross is on your back. They beat him so bad he had no strength, but yet he's all God, and he had enough strength to walk two miles with that thing on his back. Amen. And all the while, people were lined in the streets mocking him. Just four days earlier, they was, they was, they was worshiping him and praising him. Now they're mocking him. They're blaspheming against him. A little Antifa moment there. And yet, even though he could have called for legions of angels, he could have spoke the word and they all would have been disintegrated. But then there had been no hope for us. He carried that cross all the way down the Via Della Rosa to the Mount Calvary, Golgotha. He laid the cross down and then he laid on the cross, yielded himself. And they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. And then they hoisted the cross and they dropped it in the hole. And they said that when they dropped that cross in the hole, the jar of whoever was hanging on it, it would knock their bones out of joint. Again, I told you Jesus was no sissy. No bone of him was broken and no joint was put out of joint. Because he's God manifest in the flesh. He took the torture. He took the shame. He took our sins and nailed them to the cross. Because He loved us. Because He knew. Had He not done it, then when you and I died, we would suffer much worse in a place of damnation called the lake of fire created for the devil and his angels. Now if we stopped right there, that'd be a sad story. You see, right there, all that is, is all that man could expect. But see, it didn't stop there. We're talking about the manifestation of the Master. Amen. Come on. I want you to see the triumphs of Jesus. Can I say, Matthew says in chapter 28, verse 5, And the angel said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. See, he died. And can I say this while he hung on the cross? The average man died, it took three to four days to die on a cross. Now the Passover of the Jews was coming, so what they would do to expedite the process, Brother Ray, you see, when a man was on a cross, most of them didn't die from the torture. They died by drowning in their own fluids. While they were hanging there, uh, 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 they'd get to the point they couldn't push themselves up anymore. Uh, their lungs would fill up with fl fluids, and they would uh, 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 drown themselves to death. Can you imagine trying to get air, and you, you couldn't get any? what they'd do to expedite the process if it was taking too long Brother Clint they'd come break the legs mm -hmm. then you couldn't push up and get air you'd drown in your fluids it took average man at least three to four days to die and can you imagine living in a time where the entertainment was well, let's go out and see if they're still dying out there on the cross because the whole town would come out to witness this and it was a warning to fellows like this don't cross Rome or you're going to get across. Mm -hmm. But see, Jesus didn't hang on the cross three or four days. No. Just a few hours. When he see the law was fulfilled, Amen. he said, it is 
finish. And he gave up the ghost. They came, they marveled that he was dead. They thrust a spear in his side to make sure he was dead. One believer, Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. And he and Nicodemus, the same Nicodemus of John chapter 3, which lets me know Nicodemus did get born again. Him and Nicodemus went and begged for the body and they took him and they buried him in Joseph's own tomb that never a man had been in there. The angel says, we know you seek Jesus which was crucified. But then verse number 6, he is not here for he's risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Huh? I got news for you. You can go over there today. The tomb's still empty. Huh? Hey, he just like he didn't need a cross uh, 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 for an extended period of time, he didn't need the grave for a very extended period of time. Uh, 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 he just needed to change his wardrobe uh, uh, to fulfill the scriptures. He was there three days and three nights, uh, and then he rose from the grave. Uh, that first resurrection Sunday, uh, they come out for a burial, and they found out he wasn't there. Uh, he's risen. Uh, uh, Revelation 1 Verse 17, John is blessed from the Isle of Patmos to go to the future and to see the Lord uh, and His glory. And the Bible says this, And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. Uh, and He laid His right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, uh, I am the first and the last. Uh, I am He that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Uh, he's a risen Savior. Uh, he's alive. Uh, he's alive. Uh, he's alive. Uh, and He rose under his own power the Bible says in Philippians chapter number 2 verse number 9 wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father and say, why did Jesus go through all that? You see, under the law, there had to be a blood sacrifice. And he shed his blood to be what it took to pay for your sins. He went through that because he loved you. And you see, under the law, he had to be a kinsman redeemer. He had to be like, become like us so that one day we could become like him. Amen. And so he went through all of that so you could be saved, so your sins could be washed away, so that you could be forgiven of the penalty that you're guilty of. And the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, when Adam and Eve chose to sin, a terrible, terrible thing happened. Not only did sin pass unto all of us, but fellowship was broken with God. And Jesus died on the cross to restore the broken fellowship. You know why so many people get excited in here? Because they have fellowship with God. Huh? One of these days, we're going to see Him as He is. Well, these days, Brother Donna, we go up and hug his neck, just like I can come over here and hug your neck and say, Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. <laughs> One of these days. He did that to restore what had been broken. You know why your life's a mess? It's broken. By sin. But you know who's the one that can mend it? Jesus. He was manifested in the flesh so that we can get a glorified body like his one day Amen. and one day we're going to be like him one day we're going to enjoy the splendor that he enjoys one of these days we're going to be surrounded by the glory that he's surrounded by one of these days we're going to abide in the abode of God and we'll abide there forevermore because of what he did now if you're here today and you're still in your sins you're going to miss all that you're going to go to hell. And you're going to go to hell over Jesus' dead body. You don't have to go to hell. He died so you wouldn't have to go to hell. 
If you go to hell, it's not going to be Jesus' fault. If you go to hell, it's not going to be this church's fault. If you go to hell, it's not going to be my fault. I've told you, you don't have to go to hell. You can get born again by putting your faith in what Jesus did for you. By asking Him to forgive you of your sins. Getting saved is the easiest thing in the world. Getting saved is saying, I'm tired of where I'm at. And I just want Jesus. And just turn from where you're at and run to Jesus and ask Him to save you. He'll save you. Hey, say, how you know that? He saved me a long time ago. I've been saved ever since. He's been good to me. Huh? He's blessed me. I don't have to go to bed at night worried about dying and going to hell. Uh, I don't have to worry about death. I don't have to worry about anything because Jesus is not only Lord, He's Lord of my life. Amen. Can I say the Christian life's the best life you could ever live? Right. Christian life gives you joy, peace, hope, happiness. Even on my bad days, I know, hallelujah, I'm faring better than I deserve. Yes, say, Christians have problems? Oh yeah, we got problems. But we don't face them alone. We got a friend that's sticking close to a brother that gives us what we need to get through the problems. And no matter how big my problem is, it's still much smaller than him. I wonder this morning, you tired of sin? You tired of not having hope? You tired of just going through life? Aren't you ready for a change? Jesus change you. Amen. Here's the danger, Brother Brian. Everything that's going on in this country, it's prophesied in the Bible, there's no also in the last day perilous times to come. Said so they'll call that thing that's good, evil, and that's right. evil, good. Right. You're a white man, that's evil. Mm-hmm. You ought to get down and repent for being white. Like you had anything to do with it. Mm-hmm. Huh? Hmm? Oh, look at her, she's precious. Huh? <laughs> Can you imagine people hating her just because of the, mm. or hating cause just because of the color of her skin? Mm. I seen little June Bug singing in the choir. That blessed me. There are people that hate her. Mm. That's, that's that's what the Bible said would happen. Yeah. The world's in chaos because the world's ready for the Antichrist. Yeah, right. You know the Lord can come back right now. There's a danger, Brother Clint. People say, well, I'll wait till I'm on my deathbed and get right with God. A lot of people don't have a deathbed. Right. Some go to car accidents. Some just drop dead with a heart attack. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, you may not die. The Lord may take His church out. And if He does, there'll be no hope for you. Aren't you tired of worrying about all that? You don't have to worry about it anymore. You can get it settled today. Today is your day. I'd get born again. You see, he went through all of that because he knew you'd be here today and you needed to get born again. You say, preacher, I'm saved. You ought to get in an altar and thank God you're saved. Thank God that somebody cared enough to you to tell you about Jesus. Thank God you live in a country where you're still here preached. Uh, thank God you got a church to come to. Uh, thank God you got the truth. You ought to be thankful Jesus didn't leave you in your sins. You ought to thank, be thankful he's put up with you even this week yeah. when he didn't have to. Huh? He was manifested in the flesh. He was tempted in all the points like we are, yet he was without sin. But he knows what you're going through. He knows how you feel. He knows your fears. He knows everything about you. And he still loves you. You ought to be thankful. They went to the cross for you that he paid that debt for you that he puts up with you can I help you something Miss Renee when he was hanging there he not only knew that you needed to be saved he knew when you got saved you'd still fail him and he still died he still bled for you knowing what you'd do even after you got saved he still loved you what a savior what a savior you're here today and you're not saved, I highly recommend him. Say, preacher, I really don't know how to get saved. The minute we're going to have an invitation, just come. We'll show you how to get saved in the Bible. You can get saved today. Don't leave here lost. This might be the last chance you get. I imagine last Sunday, Miss Shirley thought she'd be in church this Sunday. She didn't know she'd be in heaven. Hmm? 
Friend, next Sunday, will you be in heaven or hell? If the death angel comes knocking at your door. Hmm? Hmm? See, that's settled today. Today's the accepted time. Now's the appointed time. You need to get right today because you don't know what a day brings for. Why don't you come get saved today? Jesus wants to save you. This church would love to see you get saved. This preacher would love to see you get saved. Huh? Say, so what happened if I get saved? It'd be the best day of your life. Amen. You'll find a friend you never knew you had, and you'll find a family you never knew you had. You ought to get saved today. You're here today and you're saved. When was the last time you thanked him? For walking the trail he walked, and yet he still came to you. When was the last time you thanked him for what he done for you? Boy, it's easy to look around, see problems, see heartaches, see... You know, when was the last time you thanked him for what he done for you? His friends, he's, he's done a lot for us. We ought to be thankful. We ought to bless his name. I wonder this morning, you tired of where you're at? Why don't you come? Why don't you come and meet the master who manifested himself for you? Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Folks are coming. I tell you what, Brother James, why don't you come and sing something? Pick out a song and sing it. Folks are coming and praying. If you're here today and you're not saved, why don't you come? Oh, we'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Best introduction I ever had. Oh, he loves you, friend. He died for you, friend. Why don't you come? Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Oh, thank you for first loving us. Thank you for the price you paid for me. You overpaid. But oh, thank you, Lord. God, my heart breaks. But the thought there may be some here today that don't know you. Why don't you come, Lord, and speak to their heart. Through cords of love, draw them. Show them, Lord, how much you love them. God, save them today. God, for those that are saved, help them, God. Oh, to get a new perspective of how much you love them. And Lord, help them to leave excited about Jesus. Bless now this invitation. Save that one nearest hell. We'll bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Forms app today where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.